Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar about co-packing. We're so excited to be here. This conversation is presented in partnership with Axion Opportunity Fund, Hot Bread Kitchen, and the Samuel Adams Brewing the American Dream program. My name is Meredith Medlin, and I serve as the Director of Partnerships and Impact at Axion Opportunity Fund, which is a national nonprofit organization committed to providing affordable capital and business educational resources to entrepreneurs across the country. I'm so glad to have you with us today, but before we jump into our discussion, I just want to quickly go over a few features of the Zoom tool. Everybody's very familiar with Zoom now, but just making sure um, that everybody knows what we're doing. So first, you should be able to see our conversation, see all of our lovely panelists today through the Zoom window. If you've joined us by computer or mobile app, if you're on the phone, you'll hear everything we have to say that way as well. If you're joining through the app, you'll see a chat function in the Zoom Windows black toolbar. Please use that chat button so that the chat box appears for you and you can type in any questions you have for our panel. We really encourage you to type those questions as they come to you so you don't forget them. And we'll incorporate them as we go and do our best to uh, answer everything we can during a question and answer session following the discussion based on what's typed into that chat window. We are recording today's webinar, so you can refer back to this information at a later time as well. So I'll send you a link to that recording via email after our discussion ends. In addition, as you leave the Zoom room today, you'll be prompted to complete a very short two minute survey that gives you a chance just to tell us what you think of today's webinar. Please do take just a couple minutes to give us that feedback. We really value your opinion. Okay, all of our technical pieces are out of the way now. So let's focus on today's conversation. It's such a difficult time for small businesses right now and craft food and beverage brands have been particularly hard hit in the past year. So everything that's happened since this pandemic began, really it makes sense that many of you who are joining us today are really interested in creative options to maybe open a new line of business or continue growing your operations. And for packaged products, uh, co-packing or co-manufacturing is a really great opportunity for that. So my team at AOF is really grateful to have strong partnerships with organizations that share our mission to support businesses during this difficult time. As many of you probably know, since 2008, Axion and Sam Adams have partnered on the Brewing the American Dream program with the singular focus of supporting food and beverage business owners with capital, coaching, access to networks, and promotional opportunities as well. This is a national philanthropic effort that has provided over $47 million in loan capital, as well as best-in-class business coaching completely free of charge to over 12,000 small business owners. As I'm sure you can tell, this conversation is just one more example of Sam Adams' commitment to small food and beverage entrepreneurs, and we're so glad to have such steadfast partners in our colleagues at Sam Adams. In addition, AOF has enjoyed a very strong collaboration with Hot Bread Kitchen for many years now. AOF and Hot Bread are mission aligned nonprofits that offer complimentary services to our core customers who are women and people of color who are starting and running small independent businesses. I'm so thrilled to introduce my colleague from Hot Bread Kitchen, Caroline Mack. Thanks for joining us today, Caroline. Hi everyone, and um, thank you Meredith for kicking us off this afternoon. So uh, my name is Caroline and I'm the Small Business Director at Hot Bread Kitchen. We are incredibly excited to be partnering with you all um, and Sam Adams Brewing the American Dream on this incredibly important panel. So for those of you who may not know who Hot Bread Kitchen is, we are a New York City based nonprofit whose aim is to create economic mobility for individuals impacted by gender, racial, social and economic inequality in the city. And we use a vibrant potential of the food industry as the pathway forward. Our small business program supports women and minority owned businesses and emerging food brands. Our members include many entrepreneurs who make packaged goods like jams, sauces, beverages, and chocolates. So over the past 10 years, we've served over 350 businesses in our program and have seen firsthand the need for increased transparency and clarity over how to find and work with a co-packer or a co-manufacturer. So I'm incredibly excited that we have the opportunity here this afternoon to dive into some of these issues. Also, March is Women's History Month. This is a month that is particularly important to both of our organizations. And I'm proud to say, that our panel today is led entirely by women. Uh, this is especially important given that manufacturing is oftentimes such a male dominated industry. So I'll pass the mic back to Meredith for her to kick it off with our panelists. Thanks so much, Caroline. 
I'm so pleased now to introduce our speakers for today's discussion. Um, so first, Carolyn O'Hare is the COO of Tiny Organics, which is a quickly growing baby and toddler food company that believes young children can and should eat real textured food. Thank you so much for joining us, Carolyn. Thanks, Meredith. Glad to be here. <laughs> Awesome. And next, uh, Veronica Lehman is the founder of Pure Organics, which sold to Kellogg and became part of the Kashi family of brands in 2016. And she's also an emerging brand specialist for JPG Re Resources, which is a co-packing and co-manufacturing consulting firm. Hi, Veronica. Hi, thanks for having me today. Thank you. And lastly, Jill Donaldson is the founder of Pastry Base, which is a vegan and gluten-free baking kit company. And Jill also serves as a director of sales for Hatch Kitchen in Richmond, Virginia, which is an incubator space that also offers co-packing and many other services to small food and beverage brands. Nice to have you, Jill. Excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and you all can um, look in the chat for links to all of the different organizations that our panelists are affiliated with and learn more about them there. I'm so excited that all three of you are with us. Um, so let's dive into our first few questions here. Um, when it comes to co-packing, co-manufacturing, I think one really important place to start is assessing if your business is ready. Um, so we're gonna talk about different ways to think about if a small business owner is ready to take on uh, this adventure of co-packing or co-manufacturing. So Jill, I'd love to start with you. From your perspective, what are some key indications that a business is ready to start partnering with a co-packer? Yeah, so, so first I'll say that um, I'm probably just a short couple of years ago was in the place where many of you might be today, where you're thinking of, is this the time? Should I look for a co-packer? Um, Pastry Base is still a relatively young company. Um, so the first thing that I discovered was that the whole process took a lot longer uh, than I expected. Um, even the search, just the beginning part where I was looking for different co-manufacturers that aligned with my business values, the type of product I need, the certifications that I needed, um, and that could also accommodate um, the minimum order quantities that I was ready to, to um, produce at the time. And then just the onboarding process, once I found the co-packer or co-packers that I wanted to work with, that whole process can be quite lengthy when it comes to recipe development, scaling up your recipes, doing test batches. Uh, I wasn't expecting that there would be many rounds of test batches because one recipe once scaled up that might need to change uh, in a multitude of different ways. So I would just say that to keep in mind, the whole process might take longer than you imagine. For me, it took about a year um, to, to get settled uh, with, with a large larger co-packer. Um, in terms of if you think you are ready or not to start that journey. Um, obviously, if you cannot keep up with production in terms of the demand that your retailers have, that's a, a good sign. But there are other things as well, um, including what goals you have for your business. So if you have goals that include getting your product sold at a particular retailer, that retailer may have certain requirements and certain certifications um, that they require food safety measures or you know, GFSI certifications that you don't have or that certain co-manufacturers might not have. So thinking about your goals, what you want to do, do you want to be able to go to, to trade shows and to introduce your brand to larger, larger businesses um, in the next couple of years? If so, that might be a good time to start thinking about um, co-manufacturers. And obviously there are other ways to go. Um, there are commercial kitchen spaces that you can look into if you just need a little bit more um, space, if you need a few more hands on deck, a lot of commercial kitchens have staff that you can you know, bring on to help you when you need production. So it's not sort of like one or the other, there are, there are different steps along the way to consider. Uh, that makes so much sense. If you think you're ready, it probably means you're late. <laughs> you should have started. You should have started earlier. Yeah, because it takes a while. Okay. Um, and the next thing to I think consider sort of a broad category, um, Veronica. I'd love your insights on what are some of the financial implications of starting to partner with a co-packer. 
Yeah, I mean, it goes hand in hand with, are you ready, right? Because, um, you know, taking that step to partner with a co-packer um, is an expensive, you know, and kind of risky step to take as well. And so, I mean, I think the I think the number one thing to think through and to be aware of is the cash flow cycle, which basically um, means there's going to be a long time before you have to front all of this money to get your product manufactured um, and packaged and stored between that and selling it and then getting paid, you know, by your customer. So you have to to really map that out and take that into account. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, besides that, you know, some, some other things to consider, there's a lot of hidden costs in um, dealing with the co-manufacturer. Some of the things that Jill was mentioning, you know, plant trials, you might have to do multiple plant trials um, and those are very expensive and they're, they're not generally included. Um, you, uh, you have to consider warehousing, you have to consider storage, transportation, um, all of those things will play into your COGS. Um, you know, what are their terms and conditions? Some of them want you to pay up front. Some of them will give you terms. Um, all of that uh, is really important to consider. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just the one, just the cost of getting in with the co-manufacturer. But then the, I guess the flip side is the potential for scale in terms of increasing your revenue because you're increasing your volume, right? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, yes, it, you know, the way to make money in your business is to scale your business. And the way to do that is through working with a co-manufacturer that can partner with you to do that. Um, yeah, you know, minimum order quantities obviously also play into the uh, financial implications um, and really understanding um, the, the process of payment. So, you know, you're not just paying for your ingredients. Um, and your packaging, but you're also paying, you know, what's called a tolling fee, which is the fee you pay them to make it. Um, and so understanding all of those costs up front, which all play into your cost of goods, um, is really important. Yeah, definitely. Not to be taken lightly, not a, not a quick decision for sure. All right. Um, and then Carolyn, I'd love to talk with you a little bit because there's kind of two sides to this coin in terms of what business owners can expect to gain um, when working with a co-packer, but then also some things they might need to be ready to lose or to relinquish control over things like that. How, in your experience, uh, have you looked at kind of the sides of that coin? Yeah, there will definitely be some compromises you should expect to, to make when going to a co-packer. Um, but I think valuable to recognize that you as the product owner will have some expertise that will be different than what the, the co-packer will have an expertise in. Um, so while you might be losing a little bit of control or might need to be willing to make some mild formulation changes that will work with their equipment or potentially consider a packaging change that works with the filling equipment that they have, like it's valuable to see some find some flexibility there for yourself, but recognize that a co-packer will have, my one of my favorite topics is food safety, like the level of food safety that a co-packer can offer is gonna be generally much better than you might be able to do in like a home kitchen or on a small scale. Um, the ability to uh, scale up next, hopefully you're, you're doing this infrequently, you're not constantly looking for a little bit of a bigger space. So if you can have somebody that has the, the capacity to make your first large batch and then your next giant batch a year later, um, they'll have some, some value that um, you might not have otherwise. And then another, what I've personally really gained is just a different level of legitimacy when you're looking for potentially investors or retailers. Um, there's a different level of security that is, can be found in your product by within the industry and by consumers as well once you're, you're made in a co-manufacturer. So there's give and take for sure. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that kind of the legitimacy of being able to say, you're already working with this, um, with this other partner to get to scale um, is, is certainly beneficial and probably worth 
some of those adjustments that you might have to make. Yeah. All right, um, so those are a lot of the things to think about when you're trying to decide if you're ready and kind of assess the options. Um, and then I would say sort of the next step is finding the right fit. Um, and this is where I feel like kind of the meat of this decision comes in um, and really kind of honing in on exactly what the priorities are and finding the right co-packer for your brand or for your business. Um, and I mean, at the top, I can also share just from our clients who have been through this ringer of you know, two, three, four different co-packers trying to find the right fit. It's so important to really understand your geography and your category and um, understanding that you know, every part of the country has kind of a different landscape with this, but then also you know, uh, bakery products are very different from jarred or bottled products and kind of understanding both your industry and your category, getting a sense of your niche, I think is really important kind of generally, but um, I'm sure that the three of you can speak to that as well. But um, to start thinking about how to find the right fit, um, I would love to hear, Veronica, what you think some of the key characteristics are for business owners looking to find the right fit in a co-packer. Yeah, there's so many things to consider. And like we were talking about just a minute ago, you know, there's always give and take. So I, th I think it's really important to prioritize what your needs are. Um, obviously, you know, you need um, the capability. They have to have the capability. They have to be experts at making what you need them to make. And I think you also have to think about as you grow and you innovate and you move into different products, is this a, a co-packer who not only can grow with you um, in, in capacity, and you know, make the volume that you anticipate needing to make, but also can grow with you into new products and new SKUs um, and innovate in that direction. So, you know, strong innovation, you know, maybe a priority. You mentioned geography, you know, location is, is something very important to consider, you know, proximity to your headquarters, proximity to raw materials, proximity to warehousing, proximity to your retail markets and kind of prioritize those um, as well. And, you know, we're, we're talking here like best case scenario, right? Keep, keep in mind, like we've said several times, there's always give and take. So you, you're gonna have to give something up to get something else. You know, you're, my first manufacturer was in Oregon and it was, I mean, like zone seven to ship to, to me uh, in Michigan. And, but you know what, they fit so many other of my needs and they check so many other boxes that I was able to do a little bit of that give and take. Um, I think another thing is, is really understanding your values as a brand and what's important to you now and as you grow. And if those values align, um, if, if you have common values, if your co-man is, is partnership minded. Um, and I, I mean, I almost think that that has to be a top priority. You can get a feel really fast for, you know, if they're communicative, if they're transparent, if they're partnership minded, and if you just, you know, feel good about them, um, I think that's so important because the relationship you have with them, you know, the trust you're gonna put into them to build your product um, is, is a huge risk. Uh, so, you know, I think those are kind of the main things. And then, you know, from the legal perspective, just really making sure that you take a good look at the MSA, which is the Manufacturer Service Agreement, um, and you understand what they're requiring of you. You probably won't have a lot of leverage as a startup. So, you know, understanding what risk is involved in that as well. Um, making sure you, you know, kind of protect yourself through signing a, you know, an NDA and, um, you know, keeping your formula close until you have a, a contractual agreement signed with them and you feel comfortable and you're ready to move forward. So lots, big answer to that question, lots of things to consider, um, but, you know, again, just prioritizing them, understanding where you can give a little bit, where you're willing to take the risk. Um, those will all, you know, come into play as you make your decisions. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. There is so much to consider. So we got to talk about all of it. Um, we had a, a really interesting, very closely related um, question come in, Veronica, that I'd love to hear your answer on. So 
those are the sort of the characteristics or things to consider, but how functionally would you recommend going about finding the co-packer if it's kind of, it's can be expensive to use a consultant. And sometimes it kind of just feels like a black box to folks who are just starting. So mm -hmm. where can they go to even start this search? Yep. So, um, one of the partners that we work with really closely at JPG is called Partner Slate. It's uh, a website that is like, kind of like a dating site for um, people searching for co-mans. Um, a little bit of a, of a caveat there, um, you have to be ready for a co-man. So if you're just kind of, you know, if you're very, very early stage, you might not be ready to, to you know, work with them and, and get matched to a co-man. Um, we, this is a shameless plug at JPG, we work with, uh, startups a lot. And one of the things we do for them when they're in their very, very early stages is we do a co-man scan. And so we give them four or five names of co-manufacturers that they could work with if they get to that point. So they kind of know what's out there and what to expect. And it just, it helps early stage businesses plan a little bit better. I know, I know you didn't throw that to me so that I could plug JPG, but um, it, I mean, we are here to help with it. It is a, a resource for startups um, and they are out there. I know Chicago Food and Bev, if you're a member of, um, you can become a member, it's not expensive. Um, and Chicago Food and Bev also has a, a lot of programming for startups. They have a huge database of co-manufacturers. You can just browse through it. Um, so there are resources out there um, find, to find co-manufacturers. It just takes a little digging. Meredith, I can also add, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, Veronica, about a previous job. I used JPG resources to find a, a bar manufacturer and I got the, exactly like you're describing, I got the five and I had all this information. It was great. Um, there's also, uh, it's called Private Label Manufacturers Association. It's was a food show in 2020. It was canceled, of course, and virtual. Um, but if they have it again this year, uh, every private label or co-man goes to that. It's this one show that everyone goes to. Um, the same thing, they've got a big database. And that's a really good point. Um, also at the main trade shows, Expo East, Expo West, there'll be you know sections set aside for manufacturers. So you can, you can hunt some down there too. All right, there's so many, so many ways. You just gotta know where to look. That's super helpful, both of you, thank you. Um, all right, so now we're gonna kind of flip the question. Um, you know, we just spoke about what, you know, business brands or brand founders can look for in a co-packer or a co-man. Um, but Carolyn, what, in your experience working with a few different partners on this, what do co-packers look for in a small brand partner? I've found that in my experience, as much as you can, as a small brand, as much as you can have your ducks in a row as possible is going to make the co-packer more inclined to work with you. Um, so the, some upfront questions they will ask are, what are, you know, besides main, main product description, what kind of packaging do you require? Can you send me a specification sheet? What are the ingredients that you need? Do you plan to source them? Would you require us to source them? Do you already have sources for your ingredients or do they have to find them? The, the least amount of work that you can create for them will, will be um, make it a little bit easier on you, especially for small brands like us. Um, and I've had, along with these resources for finding a co-packer, I've done the just Googling where I was just email, cold emailing and nobody wants to email me back, but it, my emails get responses more often when I can present them. Forecast, practically, of course, being able to financially afford it, which of course, easier said than done, is gonna be a good indicator for them. Um, and then also easier said than asked, but a little, just someone who can sell the dream. Like if you can both see, make each other believe that there is a longer path forward, um, such an important and critical choice um, and partnership for your business for really long term. Um, so same thing, just finding that mutual mutual connection is going to be really valuable. I feel like we should just print the list that you just 
you said. Those are all, it's like a checklist, you know, of all the, of all the different things that a brand should have ready and then just deliver that to the, to the co-packer and they'll be on their way. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, all right. We already have a bunch of questions in the chat about this question. Jill, I would love to talk about what co-packing contracts look like. Um, so kind of just generally what people can expect there. And then we also have some specific questions in the chat that I bet you'll answer as you talk about it, but we can, we can pause here for a little bit and talk about kind of the legal aspects of this. Sure. So, so first I will say that this is, as we're talking about such an important strategic decision in your business that I think this is definitely the time where you, you want legal assistance, your lawyer, or, or if you can, you know, find someone pro bono to help you, or I'm sure we can maybe share some resources, but you want someone to help you look over that contract for sure. Um, you want to be looking for, you know, the length of time for the contract. Um, you want to be looking at what is going to happen if one of us um, either party wants to walk away or needs to walk away uh, from this relationship, what is going to be the, the procedure there. Um, I saw in the chat a lot of questions about, about NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. And um, I know that the, the co-manufacturers that I have worked with in the past, um, it's, it's been just sort of something we've done in the very beginning of, of discussion, um, even before we moved forward with the contract when we were looking at recipes together. Um, it was something where it made me feel comfortable and it was something that they normally had um, at the ready. Um, there's always going to be risk involved though. You're giving someone your recipe. So at the end of the day, it's, you know, the, this is not something that can be, you know, protect, it can only be protected um, up to a certain point, your recipes and things like that. But specific language in the contract as to how you want your recipes protected, um, the fact that you don't want your recipes being produced for any other companies or for the co-manufacturer to sell themselves under their brand name. So not only do you not want your information disclosed, but you don't want your recipes you know, made on behalf for anyone else. Um, I have a friend who um, started using a co-packer, um, didn't have that specific language within the contract. And, and very soon after that co-packer was making the same product under their label. And so I see those two products actually next to each other on the store shelf. Um, it's, it's the same product, but just with my friend's branding and then the co-manufacturer's branding. So that's something that you definitely want to have language about um, in the contract. Um, I also think it's important to have um, some verbiage in there about recalls, you know, whose responsibility is it going to be? What's the procedure going to be like? Should there be an issue um, with recall? If the um, co-manufacturer has insurance for that, what kind of responsibility, whose responsibility is going to be whose? if that should happen, because I think it, it, it definitely can happen. And it happens, I think, a little bit more than, than we realize. Um, I think those are the main um, <laughs> important parts to have. But contracts, as we all know, can be very lengthy and include many things. So I'm sure other panelists might have other things to add. I can I add. Would, I would just oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I would just piggyback on there and, and say that, um, you know, you touched on intellectual property, which is, we talk about IP, um, and your intellectual property is, you know, the recipe you come with and any branding that you've developed, um, and you have to be sure to protect that in the contract, you know, like Joe was saying, you know, language, and, and even language around, um, like Joe was saying, you know, not making it for someone else, not making it for themselves, but Sometimes they have to edit your recipe to get it to run correctly on their machinery. And so if that happens, you know, who owns that formula? Um, and so there are, you know, you have to be, you have to work with a food lawyer or work with a lawyer, you know, use the expense um, to, to protect yourself with that. And, and then one other comment, um, Jill, you were talking about, uh, you know, your friend and then the, the co-man having the brands side by side, that's the exact same product. This is why your branding is so, so very important because yeah. if you create a brand 
that is trustworthy, that is valid, that is authentic, that people are familiar with, they'll pick your brand every single day over the brand they're unfamiliar with. So you can't, it's really, really hard to protect the recipe. You can't patent the recipe. People can knock off your recipe. People can take it off the shelf and um, you know, deconstruct it backwards. That can, those things can happen. The best thing you can do to protect your recipe is to build a strong brand around your recipe. That's a great point. Yeah. Carolyn, you wanted to add anything about contracts? Yeah, I just wanted to add that Veronica had mentioned before what a tolling cost is. So you might have a contract where the tolling cost is per prop, per finished good. We make something in a cup and we have a tolling cost per cup. Um, but there are other possibilities that might be like a per pound cost and like however they end up filling it might not end up in the same amount of units or a per shift cost. Um, if they have to purchase some equipment on your behalf, does the contract state that you purchase that equipment up front, or will it be baked into your tolling costs for a certain number of years? There are, especially if working with the, the right attorney, they, a lawyer will help you, you know, find what cost structure is going to be most appropriate for you for, for the time. Okay. Um, and we actually had a question about these contracts in and of themselves. Would the would this MSA be something the co-packer kind of has a standard or a template to develop, uh, like that you can add your specifications to, or does that work kind of the other way around? That the business should come with the contract ready and have the co-packer sign it. I've never had a co-packer give me one of their contracts that was ready to be signed right away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is probably I, great right yeah um, oh okay I, I that, i've experienced that uh but i would say that you are much better off bringing your own contract okay. um and and probably i mean ndas are pretty standard but you want a mutual nda and again if you can kind of bring your own that is sure to protect you protects both parties you know that's the idea um but yeah I've seen some really, really one-sided MSAs. And so you're better off bringing your own if, if you can. Um, and, you know, you can work with companies to, you know, you can work with a, a contract manufacturing lawyer to draw that up. You know, JPG, we have templates that we use for our clients. Um, so there are ways to, you know, work with outside resources to find those as well. Okay. And then one more question about contracts um is there usually anything written into the contract about product loss or any waste anything you know in that category sort of where that goes uh i have i would suggest depending on what I, it would depend on what your product type is I, i'd say but if appropriate i would suggest yes um especially if the Co-packer, if they're purchasing ingredients for you um, and you notice that the yield is not as much as it should be based on the amount of ingredients that they're purchasing, you would want something in your contract that says only a certain amount of loss is to be expected, but something that keeps it within reason, um, it, it should be in there. Yeah. Okay. And then we actually yeah, just you want Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say you want parameters around loss for packaging as well. So there, there will be, and, and most MSAs will have parameters around a certain percentage of scrap um, and food loss and packaging loss. Um, and, and that's to be expected because they have to, you know, they have to try things out and get everything up and running. And, um, and that's something that also you should, you should budget for. And, and the percentage of parameters will depend on your product to Carolyn's point earlier. Um, yeah, you'll have a lot more package waste for a nutrition bar, you know, than you probably would for something in a cup. Um, okay. Okay. And then we had one more question come in about contracts. Um, and Jill, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Do, at what point do companies uh, put this contract in place? We had somebody in the chat who said heard of a lot of people working with a co-packer without a contract being finalized. And Sometimes there's a little bit of wiggle room when you actually sign the contract. What do you think about that? Um, 
that would probably be something I would avoid. I would want to have a contract fully in place, but I will say that, so here in Virginia, we have, um, agriculture is very big. We have a lot of like farms that do some um, food packaging and um, processing on their farm. So they're just like small family owned companies that are actually great options for, for if you are looking for like a smaller co-packer. Um, and a lot of them, yeah, will not, will kind of be like, we work on a handshake. And it's like, you know, the, it still is something that I would say no matter what size um, co-manufacturer you're working with, I would recommend having having a contract in place at, before before you start spending your money, um, for sure. Okay. I think that's sound advice. All right. Um, so we've been really tactical and sort of really getting down to the brass tacks of what this looks like to put uh, co-manufacturing into place for your business. Um, and so I want now to take a minute to kind of zoom out to a much more strategic level, kind of mission level, um, because there's so many other issues that, uh, that are at play here, whether it's a gender equity lens or a sustainability focus, you know, allergen or ingredient orientations. I know all of your brands have, have those um, mission focuses at their core. And so how can a small business ensure that their mission is aligned and their values are aligned with their co-packers? Uh, Veronica, I think you mentioned this up top. I'd love to hear what you think about this as well. Yeah, um, we talked about it a little bit. And so my product was um, certified organic, vegan, gluten-free. It was super clean. Um, you know, it was at the time it was progressive in the bar market. And so I, I really wanted to find, you know, it, it didn't feel right to, to go to just kind of a, a mass, huge conglomerate that was producing, you know, food very different than what I was trying to put out into the market. Um, you don't always have the luxury to make that choice, especially in the beginning. You might have to kind of take what's available. Um, but I, I think, you know, articulating your values, articulating your food values and your company values and your mission and um, communicating that really clearly to the co-man, um, I think can, can also help you find a co-man um, because I, I, you know, I mean, I think it speaks highly for what you're trying to do and they want to, a lot of, uh, there are co-mans out there that are passionate about working with startups and bringing, you know, progressive food into the market. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, really, you know, defining that and, and communicating it, um, you know, like we talked about before, looking for commands that are partnership minded. Um, you know, if you're a woman or minority, make sure that they have that representation within their staff, um, you know, if possible, <laughs> that would make your life a lot easier. Um, yeah, but I, I think just really open communication and, you know, also, you know, kind of where you want to go with your brand. Um, and if they can partner with you, you know, it might be exciting for them to partner with you on some of your um, mission driven initiatives. Um, you know, if you wanted to source ingredients from a, a certain farm and, you know, have some publicity around that, they may, might want to partner with you in that. So. Um, I think it's just, it's about really communicating what, what you, your brand is about and what's important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Jill, anything from your experience, because I know your pastry base has kind of a similar mission focus around ingredients. Um, how was that experience for you trying to kind of find that alignment? Yeah, so I'll say, obviously the more niche your product, like the harder it is going to be to find a co-packer. Um, but I would say to think about, um, you know, in terms of your values, um, there, just because a manufacturer can make your product, you know, are they aligning with, for instance, my brand is top eight allergen-free, gluten-free, vegan, 
there are other co-manufacturers I could be working with that could make those products at their facility because they have certain um, sanitizing processes in place where they're going to make try, do their best to make sure there's no cross contamination on the lines and um, although they are a facility that may have gluten or nuts, you know, they're going to follow everything, you know, regulation wise um, that they need to follow. But that's different from working with a facility that says we don't have allergens on site, we don't allow them here. And so there's not going to be any risk of that. So, you know, again, like, to me, that aligns more with my brand and what I want people, the confidence I want people to feel in my products. Um, but that's just something that's important to me and to, to my niche. So it just sort of all depends on, you know, you know your priorities and, and your brand and what you, what promises you want to be able to make, um, to your customers. Um, there, like I said, it's, it's, it's more difficult, like Veronica was saying to, to, to find, and you may not always have the option, um, of finding a facility that is the right size that meets all your requirements, um, but luckily there are more and more um, brands and facilities that are sort of getting on board um, with the you know, natural, organic, gluten-free, like allergen-friendly products. Um, and even at, um, at Hatch where we have here in Richmond, um, different, uh, a suite of different and expanding co-packing facilities we're working on developing a whole allergen-free facility here. So it's something that you know, there's definitely a need for, and depending on, on what you need, um, you'll be able to hopefully find. Great. Great. So that's kind of step two of finding the right fit, negotiating the right fit, um, and making sure that everybody's sort of equally protected and ready for the, the relationship on both sides. And so I think kind of the third step on a, on a broad level here would be to make that relationship last, uh, or decide when it's time for it to not last anymore. Um, so Carolyn, I love your thoughts about strategies because uh, I know you've, you've done this uh, many times in the past, but kind of best practices or strategies for building and sustaining that strong partnership once you've really gotten going with a co-packer. Yeah, the best part of that partnership is going to just be a really open line of communication. Um, during COVID, the co-packer that I'm working with, they made a rule that we couldn't, um, they weren't allowing any other employees, anyone who wasn't an employee was no longer allowed to come into their facility, which is absolutely the right decision, but it was so challenging to not be able to kind of get that in-person, um, you know, communication together. So as much as you can maintain an open line of communication is gonna be the most valuable, um, but eventually, Hopefully your business is so successful that the co-packer you choose no longer works. You've got to move on and up. Um, and the the best thing that a co-packer ever told me when I was still in the vetting process and we've given them our forecast over the next couple of years. And they said, you know, based on these numbers, they said, I'd love to work with you now, but in two years, you're going to, I won't be able to work with you anymore. You'll be too big. And it was just really helpful to be able to see that I have two years to, make this work and then I'll, I'll be prepared to move on to the next. Um, so yeah, again, just, just keeping in open communication about how your business is and your product are developing. It's gonna make the, the partnership last. So, yeah. um, Veronica or Jill, any other kind of best practices or tips that you've learned along the way about making those relationships strong? I would say that it's it's not always going to be just one co-packer at a time that you're working with too. So there there could be you know a point in time where you have you know people that you trust on the East Coast and the West Coast that's able to you know fulfill orders regionally and, and things like that. So um, you know even if you start growing out of one co-packer, it could be it could be a situation where you add on an additional co-packer and and sort of make it work that way too. Um, but yeah, communication, number one, for sure, for sure. You want to feel that you're being, you're being heard and you're being, you know, gotten back to within a reasonable amount of time. And, um, I talk to my co-packers every, every day, multiple times a day <laughs> we're emailing and talking. So 
you want that really comfortable trusting relationship. For sure. Okay, yeah, I, I think that's, Jill makes a great point about having more than one, one co-packer. I think even if you, you are working with just one, it's really good to have kind of a back pocket list of other people that you know can make your product, make it well, and you can pivot quickly if necessary, um, because there definitely are times where, you know, there's prob problems and you have to, you have to pivot fast um, to a new co-packer to a new co-packer without, you know, hopefully disrupting production too much. Yeah, that adaptability, I feel like the past year has really taught us all uh, how important that skill is for sure. That's a great point. All right, um, so now I'm very excited to open kind of up to more questions. We've taken a few questions as we've been speaking about these different topics, um, but would love to have anybody from the audience just type your questions into the chat and we'll ask them for you. There's already a number of questions in there. So we're going to go back through some of these um, and get this, these specific questions answered. And a lot of these sort of touch on what we've talked about before, but there's just so much within this topic of co-packing. There's so many different directions that the conversation could go. So we're going to hopefully um, answer as many of these as we have time for. Um, all right. So I'm scrolling back up. So we have one question here um, around, oh, this is kind of interesting. There's a restaurant that has a bakery product and they'd like to start packaging that bakery product. Um, and even though the restaurant is very established, this move kind of into a new line of business, um, would you consider that still kind of a very early stage, even though it's not an early stage business because that product line is so early stage, Veronica, I'm looking at you because I imagine you might have some clients at JPG who are sort of in this in this space. So I guess what is the definition of early might be might be a quick way to, to ask that question. Yeah, I would definitely say yes, you'd be considered an early stage business. And and we've seen so much of this since COVID. Um, restaurants, you know, just trying to be creative about, you know, how, we have to shut down, but we've got all these products people love. So how do we still get them to our customers? Um, and we've been doing a ton of this in the past year, helping restaurants move their most popular products into retail. Um, so yes, I would say that's early stage. You know, some of the tips around that, um, that we find, you know, what we typically do is take a very hard look at the product, make sure that it's feasible, which, which means the ingredients, we can, we can create a supply chain for the ingredients to make enough that we can put in the stores um, and I, I'm smiling because I'm dealing with a client that um, has really interesting fish ingredients um, in sauces that they're trying to bring to market. And um, there's just, it's, you can't scale it um, because the ingredients are so unique. And we actually find that a lot with, with startups. You know, they design a product that's, that's super interesting and unique um, and there's nothing like it on the market but it's just not feasible because you can't create a supply chain. There's not enough ingredients um, or the shelf, you can't create a shelf life around it. That's another big thing with taking, you know, sauces and bakery items from fresh to shelf um, is that's, that's the big step. And that's a lot of in innovation um, and ingredient changes to be able to create a shelf life ar around those products. Um, so yeah, yes, that's early stage. There's a lot of work to be done, but it, it's possible and we, we see it happen all the time. That's exciting too, kind of a new a way to diversify the, the business line as well. That's great. Uh, thank you. All right, so with those early stage businesses, um, and I imagine the answer to this is there's no one size fits all, <laughs> um, but we had a question about what would be sort of the budgeting range. We had a few questions about the budgeting when we were talking about those financial implications at the beginning. Um, and so I guess we could think about this in terms of actual dollars and cents, or maybe as a percentage, I'd be interested to hear kind of what each of you thinks about this, how you would budget, like the amount of money you would need to set aside to, as you're starting to get ready for that investment in co-packing. Um, so I'd love to hear from all three of you on this one, just because I think it's it's so case by case. Uh, but Jill, can we start with you? Sure. Yeah. Um, 
it's going to be hard to give a dollar a month, but what I would say maybe a good way to sort of get a very rough estimate is to think about, you know, how much product do you need? Like what's the shelf life of your product? How much product do you need for the next, you know, three months, six months? Like my product is shelf stable. So, you know, it has an 18 month shelf life. So, um, think about how much you're spending on creating the product. Like how much does that product cost you to make? Um, and could you afford to pay for like, however much you need for the next, let's say like several months um, upfront or in 30 days or, you know, so just to maybe get just a roundabout number, think about that you're going to have to, you know, you're, you're no longer going to be creating like little batches per order or however, you know, you may be doing things now um, in a commercial kitchen or maybe at home through cottage food law. Um, so, so that's what I would say. That would be my best idea as to as to how to get an idea. Um, a lot of co-packers like Veronica was mentioning before, will will make you have you pay up front or have like maybe 30 day terms. Um, but there are also a lot of other costs involved. So that number would maybe just be just to do a production run. Here's a rough estimate of what I would need, not including other costs for batch testing and things like that. I think that makes sense. Uh, Carolyn, what do you what do you think about that calculation? How would you estimate? Yeah, I can, if you're doing a little back of envelope math, I, for our ingredients, um, the, I, we purchase basic organic frozen ingredients produce um, and our, what we're paying versus what our co-packer um, can purchase the ingredients for it. Their, pur their purchasing power is so much more. It's 60% the cost that we pay for ingredients. But what we can make in a week at, we're actually a, a small business at Hot Bread Kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. So what we can make in a week, our team can make in a week at Hot Bread Kitchen, our manufacturer can make in a day. Um, so, and they will only run at least one day's, a full day's quantity at once. Um, so like Jill said, start with what it costs you to make and a co-man can do, probably do that five times as fast <laughs> um, and, and maybe start there to get to an estimate. Yeah, for sure. What do you think, Veronica? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to the the, what we were talking about in the beginning, really understanding the cash flow cycle. So like Jill was saying, you know, understanding what months of inventory look like, you know, holding on to that. Um, and then it's, it's just so dependent, you know, there, you need to, you do need to really map out um, a, a, a p &L around your product to understand ingredient costs, tolling costs, packaging costs, warehousing costs, freight costs, those are all go into your cog. And, you know, and then also understand the retail price structure because, you know, what you sell it for, the retailer takes a margin of that, your distributor takes a margin of that, you know, then you have your wholesale price, you know, you should be making 30 to 40% to be a, a viable, sustainable business. And then what's left is what you have to to pay your cost of goods, which includes all those things that I, I just said. So, I mean, it's it's very important to just be able to sit down and map that out to understand where all your costs are. Um, a lot of startups get caught off guard um, by, you know, not only unanticipated costs, but just the length between spending all the money up front to manufacture and, and getting that money back, you know, with your margin again. Right, trying to float that cost uh, can be difficult. Um, and that's actually something that the organization I work for, Axiom and Opportunity Fund, helps people with a lot because we're a nonprofit lender. And so uh, we can work you know, flexible terms to help you have that injection of capital kind of upfront and then um, flexible, kind of very manageable payments to, to figure out how to, how to make that work. Um, so a little bit of a shameless plug there. Um, all right. We have so many questions and so little time. 
So I'm going to move to this next. This is such a good question. Um, is there a way to see feedback or ratings on different entrepreneurs' experiences with co-packers, like a Yelp for co-packing? Does anything, you guys were listing, you know, different uh, resources for how you can find different names of companies. Is there a way to see how people feel about those companies anywhere? I'd like to know that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, Maybe we should start. I would. I would. I would pose. Yeah, I would pose that question to Partner Slate, um, the, the website that I mentioned earlier. Um, the founder of Pat, Partner Slate, Matt, is is really knowledgeable, and he's constantly evolving that platform. So I would, I would shoot them an uh, info email and ask them that question because if anybody would know, they would. <laughs> The thing right. is, people tend to be sometimes tight-lipped about these sorts of things. Like, they don't even maybe want people to know that they are using a co-packer. Um, but I would say maybe ask for references from the co-packer if they if they have any references they're willing they're willing to give you of companies that they've worked with. Maybe that's start. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great point. The, um, a lot of co-packers won't let you talk about them. It's part right. of their NDA. They, they won't let you say, I make my food here. Um, and so it may be a, a moot point <laughs> to, to be able to have a, you know, a, a rating system because you can't really, um, most of them will probably not let you do that with the NDA. There you go. Um, all right. So I think one more, we have time for one more question. This is more of like a logistical question. Um, so do any co-packers drop ship for you so that they can do not only the manufacturing, but then also, you know, you send them the customer list and they just make it, pack it and ship it direct to consumer. Um, I don't know, do any of you work with a co-packer that does that for you? Or do you also you warehouse and sell yourself? I did. Um, my first co-packer did drop ship, not direct to customer, but larger shipments. So they would, um, they would drop ship, um, you know, two or three or four cases at a time, not boxes. Um, but I, you know, I could, in the beginning, I was able to, to sell to independent markets. And then of course the larger ones pick up, um, but it's a great question to ask them if that's important to you. Um, but if you're starting a D2C business direct to consumer, um, you probably won't find a co-packer that will also have an arm that can, can do that. There's a lot of 3PLs, third-party logistic providers that are set up just for um, that kind of direct to consumer shipping. So basically you produce your product, you send it um, to like a um, white box, what are some other ones? Um, ShipBob, um, you know, these are companies that will take your products and then break them down and send them box by box to your to your consumer for a you know for a reasonable cost. Okay, so just another uh, another partnership. Uh, if your if your co-packer can't do it, you can go three PL to help you with that. Well, I think that that is going to be all the time we have for today. We have a lot of interest, um, certainly on this topic. So I thank everybody who joined us for this conversation. And thank you for your interaction in the chat and um, asking so many questions. Thank you so much. I have to just give the biggest thanks to our three panelists, um, Carolyn and Veronica and Jill. You've each just brought such a depth of knowledge um, and you've been so open with us on sharing your experience. And so we're very grateful for your time. Um, before we go, I just wanna quickly share um, an exciting opportunity. We have um, lots of different businesses on um, the chat today. So if you happen to be a craft brewer, I just wanna share that the Brewing the American Dream experience ship is a fantastic opportunity to work with Sam Adams and the application for that is open now. I'm going to drop the link in the chat. So if you happen to be a craft brewer, certainly check that out. Um, and you can follow us on social media and all the different places um, to hear more about what we have coming up in the future. Um, and Caroline Mack, any last words for us? 
Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you again. And I love the energy that everyone has. Um, thank you so much, uh, you know, our attendees as well for your very, really insightful questions um, and super huge thanks to all of our panelists and Meredith for, for hosting us today. Thanks so much. We love partnering with Hopper Kitchen and we're so grateful for all three of our panelists partnership as well. Um, and so we will look out for information. We'll look out for the recording of today's conversation and then information about our next opportunities in the future. And hope everybody has a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thank you.